exactly doing it. All right, now we are live. We're going to be starting here in just a minute. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, and here we are. Thank you for joining uh, myself and, and Chris this morning as we are going to be talking about double tonguing. I know this is going to be really a lot of help for so many of you, and I'm really very excited to be uh, joined here by my uh, good friend, amazing trumpeter, arranger, educator, fellow Dennis Wick artist, uh, Dr. Chris O'Hara. Uh, Chris, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about yourself if they don't know who you are. Sure. Thank you again for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, my name is Dr. Christopher O'Hara. I am the professor of trumpet at Elmhurst University and Concordia University, Chicago. Outside of my teaching, I perform uh, with a couple of different ensembles. I actually just got off a tour with the Illumin Trio, which is a a unique ensemble of trumpet, harp, and soprano voice. And uh, as soon as we wrap up here today, I'm, I'm hitting the road with the Alliance Brass. So keeping myself Amazing. out of trouble. Really nice. Awesome. <clears throat> and uh, Patrick, good morning. Thanks for joining us. And uh, Patrick is a buddy of mine from uh, high school. We played in in uh, in band, a jazz band together way back in the day. So uh, what's up, man? Fantastic. Um, so double tonguing you know i the other day i was i i was seeing some posts by people talking about double tonguing. i was like you know i've never made a video about double tonguing. i've never talked about it on the channel uh this is a great you know this is a great thing that i should touch base on and i was like man i should i should bring someone on as a guest and then like your your name i was like oh i should call chris so uh <laughs> uh you know this is going to be great you know another trumpeter um you know he's a, a fantastic uh uh, educator so uh i think we're gonna have a great fun discussion about about double tonguing and for everyone who's watching everyone who's out there welcome uh if you've got questions write them uh write them in the chat it's to the whichever side uh uh the chat is write them there we'll pop them up we will answer your questions and uh we're going to share some stories and uh you know tips and different exercises uh of how we work on double tonguing, how we think about it, you know, how we, how we, uh, you know, go through that process to make sure that this is a tool in our tool bag that we can just pull out and, and have at the ready, because that's really what we need. So <clears throat> I remember the first time I ever heard a trumpet player, uh, do any double tonguing or triple tonguing for them, any multiple tonguing. And I was a junior in high school. Like I, it was, <laughs> Up until then, I really had no idea what it was. And I've mentioned this on some other uh, streams and, and sessions before. But 
um, I heard Wynton Marsalis play the Carnival of Venice on that Carnival album. And I'm like, what is happening? What is this? And of course, like that's that's like setting the bar really high. So I was like, okay, I got to learn this. And I talked to my teacher, uh, Ian Indorf, uh, who taught me uh, a couple years in high school. And he was like, all right, let's get the Arben book out. Like, we're going to work on this. And, you know, he gave me some great tips. And over the years, I've, you know, added more to it. Um, but it's one of those things that takes time and it takes, you know, uh, it, it takes, it takes some understanding and focus, but you know, for me, it's one of these things that I really developed and then I just kind of incorporated in my daily practice. And then, you know, I feel, I feel like pretty good and, and really solid about it. Like just in general, I don't know about you. Um, definitely. I mean, for me, double tonguing is an essential aspect of what I do. Um, I can't remember the last time I played any kind of performance and double tonguing wasn't a part of it. Um, the vast majority of what I do professionally uh, is usually transcriptions and arrangements of things. So I'm usually playing string parts, um, things that are fairly easy to do on violin, but maybe a little oh, yeah. trickier on, on trumpet. So double tonguing. And they don't is... have to breathe either. You know. <laughs> well, there they is that just... part. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but being able to, to move fairly quickly um, through the trumpet is is really important, especially in those articulated patterns and getting comfortable with that and being able to do that with fluency is really important. Absolutely. Vinny, what's up? Uh, my good uh, friend, Vinny Shashelsky. Uh, uh, morning. Uh, very glad to have you here. A little early for uh, multiple tongue, but you're here for the party. So I... Never too early. Never too I early. Like, I love work. I love doing my warm up early, like maybe 8 a.m., 9 a.m. And as part of my warm up, you know, I do my my stamp and my routine. And then I get into Clark and I do Clark almost every day. And that's where I incorporate my double tonguing. You know, I, I, I like I love using the Clark as an exercise for double tonguing. So um, <clears throat> that's, uh, you know, that's I get it going early in the morning. And uh, Frank morning. Uh, thanks for being here. Frank has been uh, some of my other live streams. Is, uh, it's been great. So uh, welcome. Now, um, for anyone who's totally, totally green to, to double tonguing, you know, let us know and we'll like, you know, get into the nitty nitty gritty. But um, for many people, it's it's either tuku or dugu or daga, right? And for me personally, I kind of I kind of like bounce in between depending on on the style and, and the circumstance um and the speed and uh how about yourself chris it, yeah you know it's 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 funny because when we as trumpet players like go through books like the arbens book saint jacome like all these like the, the standard methods they almost always say the two coup and that that's a great way to go about it but the thing that we forget I think in a historical context is that we as trumpet players uh, are fairly lucky in the modern sense because that's what we're expected to coup. But if you go back in history, if you go back to, um, you know, to the Renaissance and like our first method book that we still have uh, the Fantini book, um, there are some crazy articulation patterns and things that we are, were, we used to be expected to do. In fact, in the Renaissance, the whole point of instrumental music was to emulate the voice. You know, the, the, the theory at the time was that man was God's greatest creation and everything should emulate man. So instrumentalists were trying to emulate spoken or sung uh, voice. So that meant that everything we played also had words. So we were then expected to use the same articulation on the instrument that they would use to sing. So when we say like two ku ta ka, all of that, um, they had everything. Like they had la, li, ti, tu, ga, gu, di, ga, anything you could use when you spoke, you were expected to do on the instrument. Um, and it's really important, I think, for, for us as brass players to get comfortable and fluent, again, there's that word, with as many options as possible to give us the best 
um, the best set of tools to use for any given situation. Yeah. You want me to uh, pull up that, that Fantini uh, yeah, sure. that page that you sent over? Um, yeah. Yeah. So here you can see like this is, this comes from uh, Fantini's method and you can see some, some stuff that most modern players would totally freak out about here. Lay, ra, lay, ra, li, re, li. Like this is what? <laughs> um, yeah. Obviously this isn't stuff that we would necessarily use today, but just kind of as an example of, of what had been expected of us in the past. Um, and just to, to kind of break us out of our Taka Tuku prison so that we can start experimenting with other ideas. Yeah. And I think, I think, uh, you know, one thing that I learned about um, articulation in Baroque music um, was, you know, the articulation is also part of the, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the phrasing. It's part of the emphasis. It's part of the, 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 the strong and weak, you know, it's, it's, it's built into that. So once you start talking about, you know, um, some of these, these different syllables that are, that are on this sheet, you're like, Oh, that, that really makes sense. And, you know, it's really, you know, helping us utilize articulation in a different way. That's going to, um, ultimately give us the best musical, uh, result. Yeah, I mean that's that's really the the whole thing. Everything we do, whether we're talking about like scales or technique or any of the things that we are we're working on and trying to develop as players, should always be in service of the music. So why everything that we do needs to have a musical goal. And I find that very often we have a tendency to just I'm I'm going to do this technique for technique's sake. You know, I need to be able to double tongue, so I'm going to work on double tonguing. But it really needs to be looked at as part of a, a musical goal. Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I'm going to just, uh, you know, kind of talk about how I do uh, my daily double tonguing. Uh, you know, we actually we we didn't discuss before this stream started, like how we both kind of approach this. So this is going to be like a true, true live conversation about how we approach these things. Um so when I do my, uh, my Clark, um, and I can demonstrate if people would like to hear, but when I play the Clark. We're talking Clark 2? Yes, Clark 2. When ah. I do Clark 2, um, <clears throat> I play each one. I start on the E, and then I go E flat, F, D, F sharp, D flat, G, C. You know, I expand outward from the E. And I play it a bunch of times. And I slur it a couple times, and then... I do the double tonguing, but I do it backwards. So, kata 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 kata, and then kata 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 kata, right? And then kata 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 kata, because one of the big challenges for a lot of people and a lot of students, I find, when when working on multiple tonguing is is the imbalance in the articulation from the from the two to the ku or the da to the ga, and I find that that comes in two parts. The first part is the uh, imbalance of the air that we're using between the two, because as we do the 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 uh, ku or the ga articulation, a lot of people um, don't maintain their airstream the same that they do with the with the standard articulation. And then the second one is just the strength of the tongue as it as it's balanced out between the two separate articulations. So, you know, doing it backwards allows me to you know have that emphasis on the beat and really strengthen and focus on that. But when I first started working on multiple tonguing, I spent a lot of time strictly just doing the, the coup attack or the, you know, the, the K attack, the, the ga, the, and doing scales, you know, ka, ka, right? Just scales, arbonic exercises. Um, so that's how I really got into it, but that's how I do it daily. And I, you know, it's a, Kata 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 and then ta kata 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 and ta kata 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 and for me that just works great. That that's a a fantastic way to go about it. In fact, um, sounds like you may be, but I don't know if you are. Are you familiar with uh with Rudd's book, collaborative? I'm not. I'm not. I definitely recommend it. You should check it out. Um, he has a whole set where it's all kind of 
it's all written out and taken care of for you so you don't have to like hunt or make anything up but essentially it goes through uh stamp scale and then various clark exercises in each key and it's all set up so you're doing different stuff on different days um but one of the, the exercises is that clark 2 that we're all familiar with and you do it slurred and you do it articulated all the the t and then you do it all k Mm -hmm. and i'm a big fan of that um and i i kind of so that's kind of where i too when i'm doing that sort of thing um i do it very similar to what you were saying where i'll slur oh yeah do all that then so i'll do all the t's i'll do all the k's then just like you did like getting all of those ideas all of that kind of stuff and it's i find it really important to do like you were just saying a moment ago really focusing on the the k syllable yeah um, or the the ga syllable which whatever um yeah, particular... I, I, I find for me it, it like it the faster i go the the closer it it the further it goes towards the ga you know it just becomes that just seems lighter and more fluid and uh and we did have a question here um um i've been advised to work on my single tonguing speed first so we can get to that um in just a moment um uh, frank i want to get back to previous up go to karen blisnick talks about articulation in the air Ooh, i don't remember which one that was but i know it was in the interview series because karen's amazing and then what's that book uh with ride you were talking about yeah, so Wifrud's book is um, Collaborative Practice Concepts. Uh, it's actually a fantastic book to use, um, if you, especially if you're, you're using it in a lesson, because it's designed that the teacher plays it, and then as you finish the line, the student will then do the, the, the line back, and you just kind of keep going back and forth. That way you get um, the student and you get time on and get a little rest period and then time back on on a little rest period it's it's a really fantastic book there's a lot of really great stuff be, beyond these exercises i i definitely recommend it excellent um so that's uh i'm gonna just put a uh put that here in the comments here um with run collaborative practice concepts all right and uh this is not sponsored or anything but there's a link where you can find it uh on 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 with uh website there so I do want to talk about uh, articulation speed, um, and then we've got here, uh, Frank, do you find that sometimes you articulate a passage faster than you can finger it? Yes, that's a big part. That is a big part. Um, you know, a lot of people have difficulties with their multiple tonguing, and um, once there's, there's, there's a couple parts there, but like you've got to get the figured out but you also have to line it up. You got to line it up perfectly. And that's where slow practice comes in. And that's where really, you know, using your metronome and, and buckling down and really making sure that you're, you're in control and like feeling the pulse of the music and that you're, um, I've, I've actually, uh, this is a little trick I learned. I don't remember who from, <clears throat> I think I saw Arturo doing it. Some other, other people where, where if, you know, you can loosen your, your valve caps a little bit and then you can hear it click like a you know right and then you can it's just loose a little bit and then you can really hear so well if if, if you're lining up perfectly uh, so that's just a little trick uh, that that I've used in the past whenever I get into a, a situation where it feels like maybe my my tongue and and the fingers aren't lining up perfectly that's going to just like let you hear it uh, so so much clearer yeah for me um yeah for i heard that uh, that that trick um uh alan Vizzuti was talking about that in a, in a class we were doing together um and yeah that that's a great way to kind of line up I, am i really in time because you can really hear those clicks for me uh one of the things that i, I make sure that whenever i'm practicing um so I, I look at practicing in, in different ways. So if I'm working on fundamentals or I'm working on, you know, this articulation stuff, um, I always have my metronome going. 
Um, in fact, if you don't have a metronome going when you practice, you're not really practicing because the metronome is making sure it's keeping you honest. Um, so when I'm playing stuff, I definitely have it going nice and slow. We're going to just leave the metronome here. There you go. <laughs> it feels like home. So um, <coughs> with the metronome going, now you know if you're right or not. And you can line up the clicks. You can line up those clicks of the uh, the loosened valve caps. And if, if everything lines up in the articulation and the fingers and the clicks and all that stuff, chances are you're going to be doing it right. You know, of course you know, when you get to the point where you're doing like practice performance, which is a different form of practicing, that's when you can let go of the metronome and make sure you're really doing those musical things that you're trying to do, maybe pushing and pulling. Um, but always using that metronome and always practicing slow, always practicing slow. If you, if you can't do it slow, you'll never be able to do it quickly. So was it yeah. the slow practice equals fast results and, fast practice equals slow results yeah yeah there's, yeah there's 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 a lot of variations on that quote which i love yep. um because it's it it really is true you know we don't want to practice slowly but that's the way you get results that's the way you really you really dial things in so when i was first learning multiple playing <clears throat> any beginners out there if you are new to this and you're really like just trying to you know figure it out um slowly just getting that that coup syllable um you know with with the trumpet um so i i really love just doing some scales broken up you know da 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 right but with that that k articulation and you know once you feel more comfortable with it then you connect it and ka ka Cut, right then you you kind of build on it um but it's got to be slow to begin with um and i would even suggest you know doing it off the horn you don't need to, you don't need your trumpet to start practicing double tonguing or triple tonguing or whatever kind of compound tonguing you're doing um do it all the time like you know if, if you're walking down walking down the street you're walking down the hall going to class your feet can be the metronome you know, under your breath, not not terribly loudly because people will think you're weird. But you know, just if you can't speak it, you're not going to be able to play it. So get comfortable speaking those syllables, being able to do them just ka 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 ka. If you're if you're in the car and you've got the the turn signal on, there's your metronome. Anytime you have an opportunity, speak it be able to, to articulate that vocally because that's going to translate directly to the horn. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, all right. A anyone, uh, if you got any questions, thank you for joining us. I'm here with, uh, Dr. Chris O'Hara, uh, fantastic trumpeter, educator, grand fellow Dennis Wick artist. And we're talking double tongue. Uh, we're answering questions. Uh, uh, we're going to do some playing in just a little bit. Um, you know, kind of demonstrate, uh, some of the things we've been talking about, but you know, there's a lot to, there's there's a lot to double tonguing, you know, a lot. And do you, when you're working with students that are working on multiple tonguing, you do, uh, you know, double tonguing first or triple tonguing first? Um, it really depends on, uh, it depends on, on what the students' needs are. Very often, I'm, I'm finding more, more and more, even with younger students, even with high school students, that um, the that it's coming up in rep and it's something that they just, we need to be able to do this now. Um, if I have the luxury, I, I think, so the way I started was I started with triple tonguing um, cause that's the way it shows up in the Arbenz method. Arbenz. And that's kind of the way, um, the way I was taught. I do tend to start with double tonguing because there are fewer options. Um, and it's kind of slowly builds you into it. Um, because, you know, like I said, we do the, you know, all T's, all K's, TK's, KT's. Um, when I do triple tonguing, it gets really complicated because it's all T's, all K's, TTK, KKT, TKT, KTK. It's yeah. all those variations. Um, all, all the permutations. Yep. Because, again, the, the more the more fluency you have where you can put the K in any place, and feel comfortable doing that 
that's how you're going to find success when you're starting to use that again in musical situations. When you know, when you you come across things that might be a five, how are you going to yeah. do that? So are you going to start on the K, taka taka ta, or are you going to you know taka taka taka, or how, however however you feel like doing that? When yeah. you take time to to really doing that um, slowly and getting the the K's and T's to be the same, that's that's when you're going to find the most success. Yeah, yeah, and that you know. Dum bum bum gada 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 ba ba right. It's like you yep. gotta. Are you gonna start on the gada 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 or da da gada gada gada? And either you one have that that fluency. Yeah, either either can be successful, and that's the thing. You know, when people talk about triple tonguing, it's oh, do you do TTK or TKT? Well, why not both? I mean, yeah. you use use the right thing for the right for the right situation. Like for me. Yeah. I feel that TKT is more of a settled kind of feel where TTK seems to move. So like, you know, opening a Mahler 5 would be TKT. Ta-ka-ta-ta. Ta-ka-ta-ta. Whereas, yeah. um, you know, the Clark study, you know, Clark solos or, or Arben solos, that, that cornet solo idea seems to want to move yeah so it depends on on the musical goals yeah excellent so uh frank asks here roy stevens michael Sachs emphasized when discussing multiple tonguing with and keeping to stamps ideas about air um this is a good question i don't know if i can speak to roy stevens michael Sachs. um I can talk a little bit um, with him. We didn't do too much multiple tonguing when I when I studied with him. Um, but stamp, I mean, stamp, the whole idea about stamp is like we're connecting note to note full from beginning to end. You know, it's, it's like the, you play a piano, there's a decay in the note. You play a synthesizer, zzz, you know, <laughs> it's got like a square wave or, or whatever. It's like it's going to be the pitch from the beginning to the end. And like that's the fullness of tone. That's the fullness of air that we always want. And when we're articulating, it can become a challenge, you know, to keep our air column full and as wide as is necessary. Um, so I want the, the thing that I loved about talking about articulation with sax and this this is like full circle this goes back to to this uh this fantini that you were discussing at the beginning um <clears throat> the big thing that that sax worked with me on that i really you know uh, changed my playing because i hadn't really considered and thought about articulation in this manner was that when we're articulating on the trumpet it should be no different than when we are speaking like just as e just as easy like if you're going da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da, right that's fine it's working it's okay when we're talking like the way that we use our tongue when we speak and enunciate can be the same as when we play the trumpet and so many trumpeters really over articulate they overplay they over you know too much air and then they go at it and they're like da -ga -da -ga -da -ga -da. you know no one does that like no one's going to talk like that it's not a musical approach to doing things and you know the tongue can be just as light as when we're as when we're talking, and even like for those really high and challenging things, you know, it's like da, 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 you know, you it's it's so easy to like get drawn in and go da, 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 right, but we don't need to. We really don't need to. It can just be da 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 da. You know, support it with your air. Let your tongue be relaxed. You know, it's got to have the speed and the energy. You know to move but it doesn't have to be heavy it can have a lightness to it as it is in our speech and as it is in in our singing and if you listen to great um opera singers then you're going to hear you know they're not enunciating like punching you in the face with the beginnings of every every note and every articulation and rhythm like there's a fluidity to it and they're really kind of leading with their sound and i feel like if you lead with your sound on articulation in general, if that's how you think about it, then, then you know this whole um, air idea is going to be full. The lightness of the articulation 
is going to be there. The, the speed of the articulation is going to go faster because you're not going to have to like worry about like having a heavy, inflexible tongue while your articulation. So I kind of feel like it's all kind of intertwined in, in that regard. Josh is just preaching the gospel here, man. This is, this is 100% <laughs> accurate. Like all of this, you know, I think it's so, it's such a trumpet player thing to get, you know, huh, I'm going to overdo everything. And we absolutely don't need to trumpet playing and singing are almost identical. The only difference is a couple of inches, right? When you sing, you vibrate your vocal cords and the articulation is the same. When you play trumpet, you just vibrate your lips and the articulation is the same. Nothing changes. Well, so the man. more we can, we can make our, our playing about singing. And again, we sing much more m- musically naturally than naturally. we play trumpet. So our goal should always be to make our, our playing as close to what we would do if we were to sing it and that lightness again this is why i i advocate for speaking those syllables a lot getting used to to doing that and again this is why you know both josh and i mentioned the idea of slurring these passages first and that goes back to the the original question of you know keeping in um keeping in in line with stamps idea of connecting everything right so we're keeping that air moving all the way through we're getting used to using that air column with the slurred passage and then when we articulate the the goal is to not let that change the goal is to keep it exactly the same all the way through and to stay again as relaxed as we can and to let ourselves play instead of forcing the issue Again, when we work too hard, that's usually when we're going to cause problems, whether it be by creating tension or breaking up our air or any of those things. So it's it's really the idea of staying relaxed, letting yourself do it, and just just like speech. Yeah, man. Yeah, 100%. letting yourself. Letting yourself do it. I love that. Yeah. Uh, Frank, I'm glad that uh, you resonate with that. Thank you. So uh, how about a little playing? We want to uh, kind of demonstrate any of uh, any of this that we've been discussing and talking about. Sure. So, um, you know, back to what we were talking about initially. Uh, and again, just to kind of to give this for anyone who might be um, who might be new to the idea. So double tonguing. I know we've been we've been saying a lot of stuff, but let's let's just make sure we know what we're talking about here. Essentially, double tonguing on trumpet is the same concept as a downstroke and an upstroke on guitar, right? So we have our ta ka, ta ka ta ka ta ka ta ka ta. So we want to make sure that we have that kind of idea, and it's um, the articulation should be the vowel should be the biggest part of what you do, whether it be the ah the oo. Any of that, the consonant should be tiny, like maybe like 5% of the, the syllable. And then the remaining 95% needs to be that vowel shape because that's where you get your sound. Um, and this is something that you can start from the very beginning, from your first notes on the horn. Um, if you're doing uh, long tone scales in band, maybe. Maybe if you're going to be playing, you know, you're, you're playing your long tone scales as as a band. There's no reason to not start double tonguing or to even just work on the K's. So instead of. Oh, gurgle, gurgle. Instead of doing the T's, do the K's. And right from the beginning of your playing, work on those K syllables to make them more comfortable. And then you know you can use those in in any way that you you feel uh, necessary. But again, working slowly, getting the T's and K's. <laughs> close as we can that's really what we're looking for yeah we want to be able to we want to be able to when we're when we're multiple tongue you want to be able to fool everyone so that they don't know whether you're doing the 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 
the T or the K articulation. Like that's how even you want them to be able to be because otherwise we are at risk of letting the process of what we're doing um, interject itself into the music in ways that we may not want it to um, in the form of like a emphasis, right? Uh, you know, as it might be like taka 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 or taka taka taka, right? Like we need it to be totally even so it can be taka 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 or taka 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 taka, whichever one it is. Um, unless, of course, there's accents in the music, and then, then you you put them in. But we don't want to just, you know, uh, involuntarily um, accent in in different ways. Right. And then, you know, like I was just doing with the long tones, notice that I'm not putting space between the notes. It's not. But I'm keeping that air flowing all the way through. So that, again, we're, we're using the air to, to motivate the sound to do all of those things. We're, really, we're singing each one of those notes. We're making sure we're getting it the way we want it to be. And we're letting the, the K happen. We're not trying to force it so it doesn't come when we work too hard. Because, again, that will overbalance what we're doing playing-wise. So we want to make sure that we're taking taking the time to, to go nice and smooth and nice and easy. We don't want to work too. I don't know. I don't know about yeah. you, man, but I'm the reason I play trumpet is I don't like to work hard. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man, it's so e so easy, so easy. Um, yeah. No, I I uh, um, that's also important. Yeah, exactly. Like those connections, um, really blowing through the note, fill them up. And that's this is an issue that like I remember. So the Carnival of Venice, right? Um, Arben Carnival of Venice, not the not the Clark, right? The uh, the what is it? The theme, the first variation, right? Let me move over here a second. <clears throat> All right, so I remember that first bit. You know, you're dump up, dump up, right? And then da, and I remember that one line. And if you're not familiar with it, it's something to the effect of. Right, it's and I remember for the longest time, I was having a lot of difficulty with that. And it was because I was thinking about that as opposed to as opposed to right just playing it and slurring it and connecting the notes and once once I was like, oh, you know what on one note, I use this much air like it like it feels like I'm using this much air for an articulation, right. Like the energy, we, we know what that feeling is of the energy at the beginning of a note. And, well, how many notes are, are you playing in that sequence? Da, 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 da. I mean, there's so many. So if you really want to have that pop and that energy for every note, it's like, oh, we, we got to supercharge our air. We got to use like way more air than we, than we considered. Um, and in the end, are we really using way more air? I don't, it feels, it felt to me like, oh, I have to use so much more air. I feel like it really was just getting me to use the amount of air that I would have used <laughs> when I, when I slur it. But like when you have your, your tongue is going and it's, you know, doing this, it's like, there's so much happening. It's easy for your airstream to just kind of, so that's why I love doing that, uh, um, that Clark exercise, was, you know, the way that I do it, like. So I start off kind of like stamp. So, you know, putting a, uh, like a fermata on that top note. And then I slur it. And then I go directly into the uh, the double art, double tonguing but backwards. So, and 
and then forward. And by the time I, I make my way through so many of these, you know, exercises, starting the E, E flat, F, D, and like make my way through, then suddenly it's like, oh, it's starting to feel, it's starting to feel smooth. It's starting to feel even and, and, and relaxed. Well, the thing that I love about what you said and, you know, how you were doing all of that is when you sang it uh, in the, the, um, the Arben Clark, yeah. like you sing yeah. it in a musical way. And then again, that's how you played it. So yeah. again, if we can get back to that idea of, instead of thinking of the taka, 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 ta, if we yeah. can think of the, that phrase idea or the shape idea or the, what you're trying yeah. to communicate. Yeah. Now that's going to help inform you on how to do it. Not, yeah. not only from an air perspective, but from a playing perspective, from all That's of this. phrasing, yeah, yeah, one of the things that you know I always like to to go through with my students, because again, we we tend to overthink these processes, right? So we're just going to do an experiment here with, with you, Josh, and Great. and we'll we'll uh, you know anyone can can try this on your own. So here's the experiment. Can you please state your full name? Like my f full, your, your first, full middle, name, like, last. Yeah. well, yeah, man, a whole bit. Oh, um, most people don't. I'd be very surprised if anyone except uh, my family who's watching knows my middle name, uh, Joshua Simon Rezepka. So I didn't know that either. Now, here's the here's the question, and that's my, so, my, my best broadcast YouTube voice. Very nice. Um, so, <laughs> so here's the question then the follow up when you spoke your name, were you thinking about your air? No. Were you thinking about your tongue? None of it. Were you thinking about your, your lips? Not one bit. Not one bit. What were you thinking about? I wasn't. I didn't have to think about anything. <laughs> right. If anything, <laughs> like, you're thinking your name. my name. I said it a, a, a billion times in my life. Right. So you're thinking your name. You think when we speak, the things that we do in everyday speech are far more complicated than anything we will ever do on the trumpet. Yes. Yet we never think about it. You never think about your lips. You never think about your air. You never think about your tongue. And again, your tongue is doing so much more in what I just said than anything I'm ever going to do on the trumpet. So <clears throat> the problem is that we get in our own way when we want to now do this on the instrument. We think, oh, now it's different because I put a piece of metal in front of me. Now the whole world shifts on its axis and I have to do things differently. But that's absolutely not the case. Yeah, the, the, the idea of making it, of not changing, not doing something different, play it the same way you, you would speak it or sing it. And that's going to make your life so much easier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Frank, you know, you, you were asking a lot of questions uh, about, you know, some of this. And um, I think just a great approach there is like, keep it, keep it vocal. Keep it as though you would, you would sing it. And if we can take that approach then we're going to eliminate a lot of problems that that are going to creep creep in like otherwise and you know uh so you're asking here you asked another there's question. actually there's it's, a great uh a great uh quote from adolf herseth where yes. he was saying that if you're having problems technically with a passage try to think of it more musically because more often than not that's the problem yeah yeah and you know you've whatever it is regardless of what you're playing what style you're playing what register you're playing whatever it is if you can't hear it if you can't clearly hear it in your mind and and when i say clearly i mean <laughs> clearly hear the pitches the length the phrasing the the like the the tone that you want the articulation that you want if you can't clearly hear it in your mind um you're going to have a, a lot of difficulty playing it. You know, the, the better that we can um, train our ears and the better that we can hear, you know, things uh, and visualize things, the better we're going to be able to execute them. It's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. And, you know, right back to the idea of, you know, doing it off the horn, 
you know, practice, practice in a way that doesn't create bad habits on the trumpet. So being, again, that idea of singing through the passages, can you, can you sing that, that exercise or that phrase? Can you sing it the way you would want it articulation and all? And if you can yeah. sing it, then just put the horn on your face and don't <laughs> let that be, don't let it be something different because it isn't. Is that anything you ever do uh, with your, with your playing where, where you'll, you'll be like, you know, um, and then you sing and then you play it and kind of just, you know, go back and forth in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, very often, you know, when you're, when you're traveling, you know, you're on the road, you don't necessarily get to practice in the same way that you would practice, you know, at home or in your studio or whatever. So you find different ways, you know, you can get like the, the Sando valves or whatever, or just like, just kind of whatever you can do. And and being able to just kind of connect all of those pieces singing it. Yeah. And then when you put uh, it's it, you're doing the same work. I remember in high school when I was first learning that the multiple tongue, as, as I mentioned earlier, I remember being in physics class actually. And, uh, I had a, just a, a god awful horrible teacher, and I did anything I could to. And, and I love physics. I love science. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to throw shade on science or teachers or anything, um, <clears throat> but she was kind of universally agreed to uh, upon as as being a bad teacher. And <laughs> from everyone I know that 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 loved science, and uh, so anyway, I was just like, man, what a drag. I was bummed. So. I used to just be in class and I'd be like, like in my head, like to myself quietly, just trying to get like the tongue to be fluid and to get that feeling of, of, you know, the, the tongue is kind of like riding the air when you're, when you're doing multiple tongue really quickly, you know, the tongue is just, you know, the air is going and the tongue's just kind of like, it's like a stone skipping. It's just, just like right it, on top. It's walking in that flow. It's just, it's just, it's so easy. And it's not, it's not starting and stopping the air. It's not, you know, really interrupting it greatly. It's just like a, you know, it's, and really to get that feeling. I, I used to do that in class all the time. You know, it's it's fun, and I, we haven't really said this yet, so I I, I think it, it bears um, bears saying. You often hear articulation referred to as the attack, um, and I hate that term. And the reason why I don't like the idea of the attack is because it's very violent <laughs> sounding, and then then that's how students interpret it, and they think that the articulation is kind of a punch to the note. Mm. Whereas articulation is really a release of sound. It's not, uh, it's not the beginning of the sound. It's the letting of sound go. So we want to make sure there were always two and not pa for the notes. Yeah. Release. So that, that, that idea of, again, the air is going and the, the articulation is just kind of floating along with. Uh, yeah. yeah attack really does carry kind of like that that connotation of like you know like fighting like bot like energy like and release the, the very trumpet player approach yeah release release is so much better and you know uh this is going on oh my god man okay 20 years ago so the, <laughs> i'm dating myself i'm only 26 but 20 years ago when i <laughs> was in the second grade i <laughs> This is all joke. Uh, I was in college, freshman, and I had the opportunity to take uh, lessons for a month with Charlie Schluter. And he said the exact same thing. He's like, I hate the word attack. I don't like it. It's release. You know, it's... And it really is. You're releasing the air. And when you think about it like that, then... And, you know, you can say, okay, I'm releasing the air, but you can also maybe even think like, hey, I'm releasing the sound. Because then you're immediately equating air to sound which is effect effectively what it is. Like there is no sound without air. So it's like we're releasing instead of when you think attack like you're it's here when you're hitting when you're releasing it's it's far away. So that that's that's kind of the 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 thought that I like to do. 
Yeah. So like in my teaching, I have three main rules. In fact, I wrote a whole book about it. Oh yeah. Um, right. The first rule is to always play with your best sound. So sound has to be the primary concept of what you're going for. Always put sound first. The second rule is to always have the air to support your sound. Because like you just said, air is what creates our sound. So it's, it's the engine that drives the sound, but the sound still has to be the thing that you're thinking about and not the air. Let the sound support it, but don't think about the air. Think about the sound. Let your concept of sound motivate the air. And then the third thing I talk about is to then serve the music. And that's what we've been talking about, all the technique, everything that we're working on, all those things we're doing are all have to be in service of some musical idea. What are you trying to say, whether it be, um, you know, an, an emotion or maybe you're telling a story or you're just thinking this phrase and the shape in the phrase. But everything that we do has to be based on sound, making sure that sound is supported and then making sure that that sound has a purpose. And if you do that again, now you start thinking about those things in different ways, the articulation, you think in different ways. And maybe, maybe there are times when you want that articulation to be aggressive and you want it to have that because that's part of the story you're telling, but you don't want that to be a default setting. You want to make sure that you have the flexibility to do whatever it is that you need to do with that sound. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, the way that I, the way I always talk to my students, and this is, this is great. Um, you know, the great thing about talking about multiple tongue is you're talking about articulation, which is, is it's, it's all one of the same, you know, it's, it's a, I'm not necessarily sure that it's, uh, I mean, there's so many different types of articulation. There's a breath attack, you know, there's a two attack, there's a poo attack, there's a, there's a coup attack. I mean, it's like, you can really take articulation and, and create a wide spectrum, uh, there. And, the uh, the thing that remains the constant, the thing that the thing that really, you know, you can't strip away. Um, you know, you can change the the how you're thinking about it, or the vowel, or the shape, or the you know technique, or whatever. However, you can't you can't strip away the air, and the air is you know the air is gonna give you the quality there. Um, so, like I always tell my students um, <clears throat> that the quality this is just kind of a, a thing I, that, that I love is, you know, to think about it this way, the quality of articulation is dependent upon the quality of our air. And like, if we've got, um, you know, if we've got sloppy air, you're going to have a sloppy articulation. If it's not like, if you've got precise, you know, you're going to have a precise articulation, or at least you're going to have a shot at it. Like if you've got, accented air if you're really you know you're gonna have an accented note and an accented articulation and i that's how i think about like articulation as it relates to my air whenever you know we i get into the discussion or i'm in the musical situation where i'm like oh i need to really accent here i need to really i'm not thinking with my tongue i'm not thinking oh i'm thinking oh what is the shape of, of my air that I need to use that is going to encapsulate this, this note? Like, what is the shape of my air that's going to give me this musical result? And that approach changed so much for me, you know, with, with regard to playing, because it really, it really took so many of, of the uh, difficulties that, that uh, or, you know, problems that over articulating or, or whatever were, were creeping up with me. And this is something that I, you know, dealt with, with for a long time, having my tongue be too heavy and, and like too inflexible and thinking about my air like that. then suddenly like, Oh, it like it, it relieves you of a duty from like thinking that your tongue has to actually do that work when in fact you can allow your air to do the work. Exactly. And, you know, we've we've uh, we've probably all heard it. But again, it bears repeating the, the analogy of how the articulation works, um, where you think of like a faucet and you turn on your faucet, the water comes out. The articulation is just like flicking your finger through the water. You're not stopping the water. You're just kind of separating it. But the water is still coming as opposed to the on, off on off all the approach. So, again, it's that idea of keeping the air moving 
and as the air moves and we just lightly flick um i think someone had had mentioned earlier you know working on their single tonguing and it's that same oh, yeah. idea thinking of the 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 tongue as it's just a light flick and the lighter you can be with that articulation the faster you're going to be able to move it and again you know as you're doing that um, same thing, using a metronome, finding that spot where you can just do it. And then today, maybe I'm going to bump myself up five or 10 clicks. I'm going to see if I can't go just a little bit faster. And then tomorrow I'm going to start where I left off and see if I can't go a little bit more and just a little bit more, always keeping things light, always letting the air lead. And, yeah. you know, if you keep pushing yourself like this on a regular basis, that's how you develop speed. That's how you develop you know, again, the fluency and all of those things. Yeah. So, uh, Frank, uh, I'm actually going to address two things here, which we haven't mentioned yet, which is great for everybody. So I've been advised to work on improving my single tonguing speed first. Now, Clark had a legendarily fast single tongue. If, if you if you believe the accounts, you know, if you of, believe of, the hype. history, if you believe the hype, he could single tongue um, as fast as or faster than many people could, <laughs> could double tug. What was it? It was like 16th notes at, at like a 160 or so, like something ridiculous. It was just like whatever it was that he was like, oh, I could do this. Like, it's kind of unbelievable. And I have a friend, um, Avi Bialo, great trumpeter. Uh, he lives out in L.A. We went to uh, Oberlin together. He went to Juilliard afterward. And at Oberlin, he had, he had a... Um, a really really fast single tongue he couldn't double tongue like he he got away with with the double tonguing by like single tonguing really fast in certain passages but um you know everyone's gonna have a little uh, you know everyone's got certain strengths and weaknesses however we want to make sure that that we can bridge bridge the gap in some capacity so if your single tonguing speed is really slow one solution is to develop um a slow double tongue like we want to overlap the speed with which we're able to single tongue and double tongue you know if i can go that you know then if the whatever the fastest speed i can single tongue you know and and feel good like i need to practice my my multiple tonguing slower than that so that there's a that there's an overlap that way you're not going to have any breaks in your technique and your playing and ability and you're going to find that it's actually going to, they're going to help each other. They're, they're going to help each other out. Yeah. So many people, um, they have like their double tonguing or triple tonguing is fast and off. So th that idea of being able to, to do that, uh, the double tonguing or triple tonguing really slowly. And, you know, like we, yeah. we've been talking about that a lot this, this morning. Um, you know, even just doing long tones, double tongue, um, you know, half notes, a quarter note equals 60 double tongue that, um, get comfortable doing that. And so then there is, you never have to worry about, Oh, well, I have to be able to single tongue up to here and then I can do the double tonguing. Or you know, if, if there's, if you have that cross, then you can just start it at any point and then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, um, you know, like as a demonstration, <clears throat> so I practice my, you know, I do that, that Clark exercise every day and almost every day, almost every day I do that Clark exercise and <clears throat> excuse me, I don't necessarily always even do the dug -a -dug -a -dug -a -dug -a -dug -a at the end, like where I'm really going fast. Um, a lot of the times I'm, I'm, I'm slowly like slowly coo, 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 right and terry everson I, I i remember working with him and you know just going like so so slow he was he was ruthless he had this uh, little mini uh, tape recorder that you could record and then you could play back in half speed and half quarter speed, speed. <laughs> Oh my God, with a metronome. And it was just like the most demoralizing thing ever. Yeah, and, if you want to humble yourself, I recommend that approach. Yeah, if you really, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but like, you know, going slowly, 
like connecting and it's like okay that doesn't like it's, it's not sexy like it's there's nothing like exciting to that however <clears throat> you know i'm i'm still doing the movement and i'm like working on it every day so then if i do need to play something that's like faster and more complicated like whatever it is it's like oh cool like it's working my air is working like the the process is there and it's through that like tedious slow work which again it's not sexy it's not exciting we all want to get into the arbin book and and do like the uh uh which one i used to play it all the time i love it, it was like uh you know it was just kind of like these it's like and you're like okay i want to do it. it's like okay but now now it's like where was the phrasing like where's the where's the where's the direction like where are we leading what are we doing how's that really we, we Again, always, <laughs> we, always, always say, we always want it to be fun we always want it to be exciting yeah, and we and want super it exactly cool. but the the problem with that is that that's not how we get better it's not <laughs> the, yeah and it's not how we get to the gig and not, then have the result that we need right the work part is not always fun. And I think it's really important yeah. to understand that, that while, yes, I enjoy the process of practicing, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's exciting to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the results that you can then get so that when you get on stage and you're doing the, the, the exciting parts. Yeah. And it works. That's why we sit for hours and do these, these and do the tedious work. And, yeah. And it's, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're always expecting practicing to be exciting, I, I got some bad news for you. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I, I remember, uh, ITG a couple of years ago, Sergei Nakarakov played that, that piece ad absurdium. You know, he's like the only person on the planet that can play it. It's, it's the thing that makes me want to sell my trumpets. Yes. That one. He, he starts that piece out with like a two minute long section of, of double tonguing nonstop. And he's circular. Somehow he's figured out how to double tongue and circular breathe simultaneously. It's, it's really, it's really un, unreal. And some people, I remember like hearing him talk about his practice and the way that he, you know, approaches these difficult contemporary pieces. And he'll be like, okay, well, I'll take measure one and I'll go from beat one until beat one of measure two. And then I'll be at measure one and I'll start on the end of one and then I'll go to the end of one on measure two and then I'll start on beat two <laughs> and then I'll go to beat two and he like breaks it down into these little teeny chunks and just like slowly like was going through and like that is that is work that is putting the work in that is not just like busting away and be like oh it's like no he's like slow work and something to consider all right we want to dive into it. we want to like get the peace and we want to <laughs> we want to have fun just as we're saying we're going to have fun we're going to have fun on the bandstand we're going to have fun in our practice session once we've put the work in um <clears throat> however he uh you know consider for a moment like whenever we practice anytime we play we are we are creating habit we are reinforcing a habit either good or bad and if you're sight reading and you're playing something you're working on it too fast and you're having these difficulties lining up your fingers and your articulation and you're then you're just training and teaching yourself to be sloppy but like imagine for a moment like imagine like i gave you right now an etude a very difficult etude um however you practice it in a way that's broken down into pieces and so slow that that it's so slow that you literally can't make a mistake like so you you'll have a practice experience where you will have never played it incorrectly ever ever practice makes practice makes permanent there it is there's That's the it. winner so so it's like you know we 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 do the hard work 
And then suddenly, like if you can, pl- if you can force yourself to, to play it in that manner where you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to really, I'm going <laughs> to really take it slow and easy. Then, then suddenly it's like, you've, you've, you've done it. Like you've, yeah. you've so, so here's programmed the thing, right? yourself like, for success. Exactly. And that, that's the way to go about it. You know, you talked about Sergey doing that. Like I've, I've heard Hogan talk about that. Like every amazing trumpet player that you have ever heard in your life will say the exact same thing. They will tell you to break it down, to do it really slowly, to repeat your successes, to get to the point where you can't make a mistake. And when you listen to them, you go, oh, obviously. But then when it comes time to sit down and do that, we're like, yeah, but I just want to get to the end. I want to get to the fun part. And if you do that work, if you're willing to do that work, that's when the successes come. And again, so, you know, break up your practice. You should have practice that is work that is this kind of thing that we're talking about whether you're working on the articulation or you're working on learning a piece of music and you're doing it in this really slow methodical approach yeah also give yourself time to have fun to do the fun things and to go crazy and just you know play and play for fun separate the work and fun so that you can have both but it's really important to do the work portion yeah, and, and that's a great point about separating them. So, you know, have a clear distinction. Work, fun, um, because if everything blends together, then everything's work. Sure, everything's fun, but it's also like, oh, this is work. Um, you know, we can we can compartmentalize and we can, you know, be like, okay, I'm going to put the, you know, some people love, I'm sure plenty of people, NBA, like love bench press and squats and doing the hard work and like, lifting and doing all the but they really they want to play they want to play ball i'm sure some of them really love doing like shooting drills and just like but they really want to play like and um that's that's a great point um this has been like such a fun chat that where we were talking about like articulation and it's like morphed into practice and like theory and all this <laughs> it's all the um, same it is and it you reminded me of uh i remember hearing uh winton marsalis in a in a master class you know winton loves basketball and like on the road for years and years and years, he would always like do pickup games and like play with play with guys in the team. And he wanted to be in the NBA, which is hilarious because if you've ever met Winton, he's not a very uh, tall trumpeter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he loves basketball and he's by all accounts a, a great shooter and a great player. Um, but he would practice like when he was when he was young, he would practice like uh, getting 100 free throws in a row. Which means if you get to 99 and you miss, you got to start again. And he took that analogy to music. And he says, okay, like, can I play this correctly 10 times in a row? Can I play it perfectly 10 times in a row? And it's like a lot of us, we want to get to that point where like, oh, I played it right. I'm going to leave it like that. I'm not going to touch it. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, just because you got it right one time doesn't mean that you've set yourself up for success on the bandstand, you know, in the recording studio, like you, you, you want to, you want to, you don't want to, we've heard this saying, you don't want, you don't practice until you get it right. You practice till you can't get it wrong. And like, that's, that's, that's kind of like, you know, this big overarching uh, theme. And it's, I think it's perfect um, really for multiple tonguing because whenever multiple tonguing creeps up on us, it's going to be a difficult passage. It's going to be something that's technical. It's going to be something that's fast. And thankfully, a lot of the times on the trumpet, when we're, when we're, when we're doing multiple tonguing, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like a, maybe on, on one note, you know, it's not like changing every single time, but sometimes (laughs) note, regardless of what style you're in, you know, even if you're playing pop music, you know, like, go play uh, uh, September uh, with a band and uh, wait until they count it off too fast. And then you're going, (laughs) it's like you're multiple tongue. You are double tongue fast in the upper register. And it's, and it's not just like moving around in a scalar manner. It's like, 
it's jumping around and like we have those instances that we we've got to prepare ourselves for um so you know putting in that hard work early on is going to allow you to get to those situations and really feel feel confident and and you're not going to have to think about the technique then yeah that, that, so yeah. i'm gonna i I'm, I'm gonna have to to jump out of here real quick yes yeah in a little bit but the the last thing that um i'm gonna throw out and it's gonna go right along with what you just said is while um arbin and saint jacome are fantastic resources uh for doing this sort of thing i would urge everyone to create your own exercises and create your own exercises based on repertoire Arben and St. Jacome uh, almost exclusively are scalar patterns, uh, which are great. And that's going to help you to get started. But from there, you want to start looking at, well, what is it that I have to play? What is the thing that I'm currently working on? And then build an exercise based on that. Sometimes it's going to be scale based. Yes, but it's not always just going to be a major scale. You know, if you're playing the Artunian, those aren't major scales. So you want to make sure that you're playing it based on on the stuff that you're working on um, and let that then become the exercises that you do. Adapt your articulation practice to the things that you are trying to achieve, again, musically. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, I was, I was actually as the last thing I was going to ask you if you could uh, uh, if you could share some of your favorite, you know, methods or resources for you know, working on multiple tonguing. So, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, Arbit, like I said, Arbit and Stage Chrome are great. I really love um, what, uh, what Riff Rudd did in that book that, that we mentioned. Um, and I really, really recommend that. Just even going through the Clark studies, because um, one of the great things that he does is he presents all of those exercises, both in major and minor. So it's done in a slightly different way than you might normally see it. Um, um, you know, I guess shameless self promotion. Yeah, my book oh, is awesome. Yeah. Hold it, hold it up, hold it up, so everyone can see. <laughs> no, really, hold it so, up. There we go. Yep. So, trumpet and the rule of three is uh, is my book, and it does it does exactly the the thing that I said. So, like when yeah. we're talking about articulations, um, and all of that stuff, I I base my articulation studies not just on um on a scale based pattern necessarily. But like, I don't know, here's a here's a bit from, you know, Artunian. You know, it's based on the stuff that we're doing in the Artunian concerto. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, some, it's, it's rep that we're going to have to use. It's stuff oh, yeah. that we're going to need to play. It's so. Like, yep, exactly. Right. Exactly. We all love that when we're playing it. Right. All most the, people, all the most people that never practice it slurred. But yeah, exactly. that's, or, that's I don't what know, you got to do. I'm flipping through my book here. So, so like triple tonguing stuff. We got some uh, Rimsky Korsakov. We got some Scheherazade, mm -hmm. right? So, dun, da, 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 da. so being able to do all of that kind of stuff and base your your practicing on whatever it is that you are currently working on. Yeah, and I love the idea of taking whatever it is you're playing and adapting it for multiple multiple uses. And that's something, actually, if you watch the very last uh, uh, interview video that I posted, uh, number eight in my series, uh, you know, where I speak with 17 different trumpeters, um, skip over to uh, Michael Saxon, and, and he's talking about, like, the question was, what's the most neglected aspect of practice or preparation? And, you know, he touches base on, on the idea, like, hey, Arben, you know, St. Jacob Clark, all of these books that we have, like, that's the starting point. And like playing the exercises that are written in the book, again, is a starting point. And it's not like that you've played it and that that's all you can get from it. Um, I've never played um, uh, Charlie A2, you know, uh, where I've where I've double tongued, you know, but actually like that might be neat. That might be fun. I remember him telling me like, hey, now play this like in a jazz style. Now play it in this style, like things that were never suggested in the books. But it's like it's taking you and it's bringing you to a new place and it's show and it's like illuminating new things. And that's such fantastic advice that like taking rep, taking musical 
ideas and using that as your starting point for doing the articulation studies because uh, it's gonna it's gonna allow you to approach it from a musical um, uh, frame of mind as opposed to oh <laughs> yeah yep. well, not technique for the sake of technique <clears throat> technique yeah. for a musical goal yeah yeah so I I think that's probably like a great uh, definitely a great a great place for us to end but like a great place a challenge for all of you watching you know whatever it is right now that you're working on you know take that and find a way where you can create your own set of exercises out of it um and you know break it down in a manner um and incorporate these 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 techniques into it you know double tonguing or triple tonguing and then like allow yourself to you know take something that you're really comfortable with and something that you're really familiar with from a musical standpoint um and let that you know kind of be your vessel because uh you're gonna you're gonna notice like as soon as you start approaching you know these technical studies in a more musical manner like from a mu more musical like frame of reference then you're not going to think, oh, it's a technical study. Like, oh, this is a musical study that's going to help me develop and build my technique, which uh, I think we should maybe eliminate the whole terminology of technical study and <laughs> just be like, okay, it's going to be a musical study um, on technique because I think that, you know, for some people that, that may automatically put them in like a certain gear where like then they say, oh, technique. There's no such thing as advanced fundamentals. There are just advanced musical situations that require strong fundamentals. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. Well, this has been a blast. Um, thank you all for joining us and for asking questions. Uh, and uh, once again, a very big thanks to uh, Chris O'Hara. And you thanks can find out about Chris. Uh, oh, of course. Uh, you can find out about Chris uh, on his uh website what's your website it is chris j o'hara.com chris j o'hara.com um i'm gonna just kind of put that in the uh in the in the chat here so you can you can find it that is uh where you can connect with him and uh you know find out what he's about and of course you are teaching at uh share with everyone uh, one more time where you're where you're teaching sure Elmhurst University and Concordia University, Chicago. All right. So everyone in the Chicagoland area and further, if you dug this, right, you know, uh, there, there were no lies told today. Uh, <laughs> you know, just, just, just practical, great advice. You know, it may not be the sexiest, most fun advice, but it's going to give you the results and results on stage are sexy. You know, results in the practice room, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, right? It's that whole thing. It's like, <laughs> that's not where we want the results. We, you know, like we, sure, we want the results in the practice room, but we really, like, we're aiming to create musical moments and connect with people. Like, that's what we're going for. Um, so, you know, good, good, good things to uh, um, off topic, but tip for reducing mouthpiece pressure. I, I may just stick on here a few more minutes. If, if people have some questions, Chris, I know you have to go, so that's yep. totally fine. Gotta um, hit the road. Gotta yes, show tonight. Chris, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and, uh, uh, very greatly appreciated. So I'm going to just, uh, address these final questions if we've got any. So, uh, uh, Chris, thank you again. One, one more time. Uh, great, greatly so appreciated. Much, All right. I'll talk so to you soon. Fun. Have a good time. Yep. Cheers. All right, so Razvan, um, welcome. Thank you. I know it's off topic. A tip for reducing mouthpiece pressure. Yeah. Um, so we do. We need some mouthpiece pressure, but for most people, they're using too much. We don't need that much mouthpiece pressure. We need to be able to form and create a seal. The mouthpiece on on our lips. Now here's an issue. Many of us from years of playing are used to like, like really putting it on our face and smashing it. And because of that, we have like a lot of, of subconscious things that we do. We're not aware of it, um, but it's actually adding pressure without us, you know, 
thinking about it. So a couple of things, <clears throat> reduce mouthpiece pressure. One thing is just hold your, hold your trumpet lighter. Like be more gentle with how you hold your trumpet. Like look at my hand here, nice and relaxed. I'm not like, you know, gripping it crazy. Like you don't have to, it doesn't have to be that hard. You can grip the trumpet lightly. And actually like, if you can, if you can put the trumpet like that and balance it and hold it now, you don't want to, you don't want to perform like this, obviously, but like as an, as an example, it's like, that's going to reduce like all of your tendencies of, of pulling and, and you're going to actually realize like, Oh, I'm just naturally used to when I put the trumpet up to my face smashing because that's just what we've created a habit of doing for over years. So, um, this was very eye opening for me back when I was a student at Oberlin, Roy Popper, he was talking about mouthpiece pressure all the time. Uh, you know, get your pinky out of the hook. First of all, put your pinky up on top. Much better place. Much better place for it to be. If it's in here, you're going to have a tendency to pull it on your face. Now, this is something that I had never seen anyone else advocate. But for me, this worked really very well. Um, take your, your trumpet and just gently put it on your cheek just so that it's like actually touching and sealing. So it's actually just touching and sealing completely on your cheek. Just do that real gently. Don't press it into your cheek, just like form the seal, okay? You can feel that the mouthpiece is here. Um, so I'm not using pressure, but you can feel if you're pressing into your cheek. But like this is just as an exercise, like, oh, I can bring the trumpet up to my face without smashing because I've removed the chops. I've removed like my habits from it. It's like, oh, I'm taking it, putting it on the side of my face. Oh, this is, oh, it can be like relaxed. It can be very gentle. And then take that feeling and transfer it to the trumpet. And it may feel like, oh, I, I'm not, I don't have the seal that I want. Like I'm not there. Um, so that means, you've been practicing for a very, very long time, getting used to having to use lots of, lots of pressure. So you're just going to have to, you know, kind of start to peel back the layers. And Roy used to, you, Roy used to have, have us practice. Sometimes he would say, okay, I want you to only play <clears throat> like the minimum amount needed for success. Like if you, if, it, if it's going to take 10 effort, effort of 10, whatever, you know, whatever scale you're using, it's going to take this much effort. I want you to like try it with just a little bit under until like you're going to fail, you're going to fail and then just slowly creep up until boom, you've got it. Then you're not working too hard. So with the trumpet, as far as, you know, the pressure is concerned, if we can, if we can show ourselves that we can physically bring the trumpet up to our face with ease and relaxation, then we can bring it to our face and do the same thing. Then we've got a chance. Then we can say, okay, horn is up. It's easy. It's relaxed. Now, if you're having difficulty, um, <clears throat> I love, I love breath attacks. I love the, the poo articulation, the breath attack where we're just, it's just strictly air starting the note. And that can be done, uh, you know, on the mouthpiece. It can be done on the horn. But really getting <clears throat> really getting to that point where, where we can play. Let's see if I'm going to get in focus here. Um, really getting to that point where we can play and we're going to have it um, be relaxed. And if it feels like if it feels like you're using too much pressure or it feels like you're trying to use your chops too much, <clears throat> anytime that we feel and think, oh, I have to use my chops, um, <laughs> recognize that you, you, you probably um, need to use more air. Like if, if it feels like, oh, I'm not getting the notes, I need to adjust something with my chops. In reality, you probably actually just have to adjust something with your air. And we can compensate for the pressure that we used to feel that we needed with the trumpet by using greater air.
like whatever it is, okay, air, <sighs> connect. Like I'm using more air, I'm not using more chops. And I mean, it's all intertwined. So when you say, hey, how do I use, uh, maybe actually, uh, uh, Rasan, can you, can you elaborate on that? Because I'm really interested, you know, reducing mouthpiece pressure in what circumstance, right? One more tip. Um, when we breathe, every time we breathe, every time we breathe, we have the opportunity to take the horn off our face. All right. And I don't necessarily mean physically remove the horn from your face, like a centimeter or an inch or far away. It can also mean we can just completely remove the pressure of the horn off of our face. And that's just going to allow some blood back into the lips and it's going to allow us to feel better. So. Like whatever it is, every time we take a breath, we have a chance to kind of reset the pressure of the mouthpiece on our chops. So hopefully, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. And, uh, if not, you know, uh, let me know if you got any more questions regarding that. Any other questions from anyone? And thank you all for joining in. If you're watching, I greatly appreciate that. If you're watching on the replay, I'm doing these live streams once a week now. So uh, please, you know, check the page. You're going to see they're going to be scheduled at least one or two days in advance. And I'm going to be uh, adding links to these in my email uh, blast as I send them out. So you're really going to be able to, uh, you know, plan more in advance. But um, I would love to know what you all would be interested in in hearing about, like what topics, you know, what, what would be good to cover. Um, I think it was great having Chris here, having a guest, uh, you know, a lot of fun, uh, a good conversation. Um, but if we don't have any more questions, then uh, I'm going to uh, uh, get back to practicing and getting back to doing some work here. Uh, I did a nice little warm-up session earlier, so, um, you know, I've got some etudes to play through and, and, and some other material to, uh, to work on and practice. Um, so if there's any final questions, let me know. I'll get to them. And, uh, you know, uh, I, will be, I will be back, I don't know, next week. Next week I'm going to be traveling a little bit. Um, and uh, I will see if I can uh, uh, get my, my mobile setup, you know, working properly so that I can, I can be uh, on the road and do one of these live streams. But otherwise, I want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank you for being here. And I appreciate you for uh, checking out the channel and stopping by and for writing comments and for, you know, chiming in and, and, and everything. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been great hanging out with all of you. So if there are no more questions, then uh, I will see you in the next one of these, which will be coming up soon. So uh, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. And uh, have an excellent rest of your day.